Welcome, everyone. You are at State of Play, um, the August 2024 call out here in the San Francisco Bay Area with Indy Marin. My name is Lori Friedman. I'll be your host for the call today. I want to introduce some of my colleagues that are here today to help with this presentation. Susan Morgan is our founder and director, and she's um, managing the chat today. She'll also be helping out with the Q&A and um, presenting some programming at the end of the hour. Big thanks to her for all of her support in these calls. Um, Betsy Guthrie is our Zoom lead. She'll also be talking about canvassing today. Thank her for all, I thank her for all of her work um, behind the scenes to make these calls possible for us. Joy Martin is a co-lead of the writing team and she's here today to present that program. Susan Spitzer is from texting and Jane McClure is one of our senior uh, phone bank trainers and she'll be here today to talk about our phone banking program. Next slide, please. Our agenda has been fairly consistent over the course of the last couple of years doing these calls. We'll talk in general about the election landscape. I'll do some updates on the Senate and the House races. We always pick one area to go in depth with every call and this, obviously today it will be the White House and the presidential race. Um, we'll end with um, a brief overview of the voter outreach landscape and then our team presentations on how to volunteer and all of the races that we'll talk about today. Um, it's a very data heavy presentation. There's a lot of information. Uh, we usually go close to the end of the hour. I'm happy to stay over for a few minutes, about maybe 10 minutes or so after the call to answer some questions, um, but we'll try to get to them um, if we can before the end of the hour. Next slide, please. All right, uh, changes in the national landscape. We've talked a lot about the Democratic advantage in this election. This was before the change in the ticket. We knew we had a lead in fundraising. We know we have better grassroots. Uh, we have inc an incumbency advantage really across the board. Um, but there's a lot of new, obviously, changes in the last month that have just are, really are of a historic nature. The Kamala effect is real. It is documented in voter enthusiasm, um, in voting patterns. We're seeing an increase in volunteers turning out, hopefully taking action today. Um, we've seen spikes in fundraising and voter registration. Um, another change that we're starting to see, and this is the time of the cycle where you're gonna start to see the parties move money around in response to their own internal polling and their internal information. And we saw the first crack in the RNC this week when they pulled their Senate money out of Ohio, um, which was really kind of a, a surprise. Um, and they're going to be turning over that to the dark money super PAC. Um, but they're they're fairly limited on funds and they're starting to move things around. And that's a good sign. Um, we have put initiatives on the ballot across the country in states, over two dozen states, from anything from voter um, security to reproductive rights to gerrymandering. Uh, minimum wage, um, and it's a way to uh, drive voter engagement um, and get more people involved in the election process if we can get these initiatives on the ballot. And updates on that, uh, we're really excited that Arizona got um, their reproductive rights initiative added. We're hoping for Montana and Nebraska later this month. On the issue front, no changes in the polling. The top three issues continue to be inflation and costs reproductive freedom and the immigrate and immigration on the border. Depends on who you're talking to and where you are, but those are consistently still the top three issues. In California, though, you will expect to hear a lot about climate, climate issues, especially around um, the financial costs of climate change. Next slide, please. All right, I'm gonna start with the Senate. Um, briefly as an overview, we'll be at 50-50 in November. When we vote, we will lose West Virginia. That means that if everybody holds their seats, whoever wins the presidency will um, control the Senate. Um, there are 34 races up for election this year. Only seven of them, though, are considered vulnerable. The challenge for us is that they're all ours to defend. We don't have an opportunity to flip a seat or pick up one like we did with John Fetterman's seat in 2022. There are two states that have um, less competitive races, Texas and Florida. Um, there's nothing in that polling or information that looks like those are moved any more competitively. We'd like to expand our power there, expand um, our presence, but they are not in play to be flipped at this point. Next slide, please. So the seven states are Arizona, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And there is some crossover with the presidential states, but these are the Senate battlegrounds. 
We haven't really seen a Kamala effect um, at this level. The, the top map is the way the state sort of laid out initially at the beginning of the year before all the primaries. And you see those yellowish beige states, those are toss ups. And that means that a race is anticipated to be decided by less than two points. And those are vulnerable. That means that a major political event, a scandal, a fundraising issue, or a very strong voter outreach movement can switch um, the leader or the winner from one party to the other. And <laughs> as we've moved through the year and we've elected Republicans um, to be our opponents in these states, the races have firmed up. And we have seen a, a map now that looks quite a bit bluer um, than it did before. Um, the gray states are states that don't have a Senate race. Um, but you see states like Nevada and Arizona now mm -hmm. are considered um, lean Democrat. Um, and uh, Michigan is the only one that is sort of up in the air. I think it will also ultimately be moved to a lean Democrat, but overall a bluer map now. Next slide, please. Go through the, I'll go through the races briefly, um, just to set you sort of on the final path uh, towards um, November. In Arizona, Representative Ruben Gallego now is our candidate. He will be running against Carrie Lake, who we remember as the election denier back in 2022. His first poll post-primary was nine points. That's a very strong uh, position to be in coming out of the primary. He's already polling with over 50% of the vote. Um, likely that um, this is a, a race that is in good, in good shape. Pennsylvania is another one that has been polling consistently, really up in the double digits, like between 10 and 14 points now for a couple of months. That's um, incumbent Senator Bob Casey running against David McCormick. And what you'll see as we go through the Senate races is this pattern of millionaires with no political experience um, as the candidate. And this is because of the grim sort of financial shape of the RNC that they were recruiting a lot of millionaires to run. And the voters don't seem to be warming um, to them very well in these states. Uh, Wisconsin is another millionaire, Eric Havdi, is running against longtime incumbent Tammy Baldwin. Her first polls are also very encouraging. Next slide, please. In Nevada, we have Jackie Rosen um, defending her seat. Sam Brown, another businessman running. Um, this was sort of a shocking poll that she's really opened up somewhere between really 10 and 18 point lead. That is, people don't really win elections by that much in Nevada. She's very popular. She has come out with a lot of ads very early, taking a very aggressive approach, um, doing much better actually than either Biden or Harris is doing in Nevada. Um, and then in Michigan, uh, this is an open seat through a retirement. Um, our candidate is Congressional Representative Alyssa Slotkin, very well known there, longtime elected um, politician in Michigan. Um, Mike Rogers is the most qualified of all the seven candidates that the Republicans came up with. He's an ex-congressman they brought out of retirement. This was a very recent primary. Her first polls, although, are quite good. And this is a state that I would expect would be clearly moved to the Democratic column um, within a month or so once we have some more um, evidence. Next slide, please. So this leaves the two toss-ups. Um, remember that the Republicans only need to win one of these races to take over control of the Senate, regardless of who wins the presidency. Um, so these were their targets from the beginning. Um, Brown in Ohio is sort of an iconic politician. He's held elected office there for decades. He's only lost one election in over 50 years there. If anyone, it defines the um, incumbency advantage, it is him. Um, we lucked out. We got a very poor candidate, Bernie Marino. This was an early primary, and he has led consistently from the outset. And again, they've pulled out ads, um, directly pulled out money from Ohio this past week. Um, and the reason is they're putting everything they have into Montana. The other states, as we can tell by polling, look really good for us. This is their biggest chance. Um, Montana is an extremely red state. Um, John Tester, however, is as iconic there as anybody. He's been holding office as a Democrat there for decades. Um, his races are closer. He benefits from having a libertarian on the ticket when he runs, and we do have one this year in Sid Dowd. Um, his opponent will be another millionaire, Tim Sheehy. 
Um, polls are a little more sparse in Montana, but uh, we've seen everything from him being down five to up five, but no good polling yet with Dowd on um, that ballot question. So we're gonna keep to follow this, but this is the primary Senate race. Um, it is expected that over a hundred million dollars will be spent in this tiny state that has about 450,000 voters. Um, that will be by far a record setting race. Next slide, please. On the House side, we need to get to 218 to flip the House. That is a very, very clear path, um, clear road to do that. That is not an insurmountable challenge at all for someone in our position. We will get a general election bounce. Democrats vote more frequently in presidential elections, and we lost a lot of seats in 2022 in the House by very small margins. So it is not a stretch at all to say that that big bounce that we're going to get is going to help clear a lot of those losing margins and turn those districts back over to us. We need to net four new seats. Um, and again, a very, very direct path to doing that. Um, they don't poll in the House like they do in the Senate. It's expensive. Um, congressional campaigns just don't have that kind of money. Uh, we can look to the generic ballot for some guidance. That's a question that's a sort of a national poll that asks people would you rather see Republicans or Democrats in power? And we're holding very strong at about at least around two points um, up on that. And that is a very encouraging sign that ballot usually correlates to who wins in November. Next slide, please. Next slide. Are we stuck here? Uh, I've moved to the next slide. Next slide, please, Betsy. I, I'm looking at the next slide. I'm sorry, oh, no. I moved it. That's right. Um, okay, so uh, battleground uh, for the House. Um, this is, map is sort of deceiving because so many of the blue Democratic districts are very tiny and bunched along the coasts um, of either both sides of the country. But we really do just have four less seats than they do. Um, the yellow ones, again, are the toss-up races. Those are the ones that are likely to be decided by less than two points. That's where we focus. 95% of flips that happen um, during uh, on for the House happen in those toss-up districts. So that's our strategy to hold on to the 12 toss-up races that we currently hold um, as incumbents and then work to flip four on the other side. For every race that we lose as a hold, we have to pick up another flip. And there's not that many to choose from. So the holds are extremely important. We call California the road to the house this year because we have the most amount of seats in play, but other states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, Arizona also are major players this year. Next slide, please. A little bit about California. I'm not gonna go into the districts today. We've done that before in the past, um, but we are very closely connected to these districts. We're working in them every day. Um, we have a lot of contacts on the ground and I have talked to the campaigns myself and they are definitely seeing a Kamala effect all the way down ballot in places like the Central Valley. They're seeing an increase in voter registration. They have felt uh, seen an, a fundraising bump for themselves, more volunteers. So definitely coming all the way down um, to congressional races. And they're very excited and they, they are hoping that that additional bounce will help, especially here in California. We're likely to see a lot of voters very excited about electing someone from here um, as our next president. The polls are internal. There's not a lot of um, exact information coming out, but all five of our candidates are leading. Um, and those, those include four challengers with longtime incumbents um, and one hold. In 13 and 22, and I think Betsy can show you there on the map where they are with the cursor, are in our Central Valley. And then 27 is above Los Angeles. Um, we've got 41 out in the desert area and a small district, Katie Porter's district, um, is up for grabs in Orange County. One quick shout out uh, to our phone team. I know many of you are here today. Uh, Rudy Salas is running in 22, and um, we have made more phone calls into this district than any other district in the state, um, and it's not a surprise that he has the largest lead of anybody in California, any of these five districts. Um, just more evidence that phone banking and voter outreach really does make a difference. Next slide. 
All right, we'll get into the presidency. That's where um, I know everybody really wants to, to get into the into the meat of what's going on right now. Um, when we talk about the presidential race, we talk about battlegrounds too. There's seven of them and they are there are some overlap with those Senate races we talked about, but they're grouped into two areas. We talk about the Sun Belt, uh, which are the Southeast and the Southwest part of the country, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and North Carolina. And those states usually are a little bit stronger for Republicans. Um, the Rust Belt states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin tend to be historically a little bit stronger for Democrats, but both parties have won in both areas, um, just a slight advantage. Um, Biden um, is, was especially strong in the Rust Belt. He's from Pennsylvania. It's one of the reasons that Obama chose him many years ago. Um, we call, call that area now sort of the blue wall. Um, and the question really is, is what is her electorate? Is it going to be the same as Biden? She seems to be a little bit stronger now in those Sun Belt st uh, states. Um, she still needs to do some catch up work in the Rust Belt. Um, but that's sort of the way it lays out. And as far as the map goes, um, the first map on your left is the way the states looked in May before the primary, before the debate. Um, sort of at the beginning of the election season. And you can see there were quite a few toss-up races. Um, one lean Republican state in North Carolina, but the rest were considered a toss-up. The map to your right is the map after the debate. And you can see it looks much redder. Um, some of the blue states got lighter blue and we, uh, we lost a lot of the toss-ups um, as they were moved to lean Republican. After Kamala took over the ticket, the map has reversed. It's gone all the way back to the way it was. So she's completely reversed, at least on the map, um, the trajectory that we were headed um, after the debate. Next slide, please. The state of the race is um, often described uh, through national polling averages. And this is just a daily number that people come up with by averaging polls. and. It's helpful because it shows the amazing trajectory that she has accomplished in just a few weeks. Um, this would uh, this would uh, correlate to the popular vote that she's up by two points now after being behind by by well uh, Biden behind by so much more uh, the day he turned over the ticket to her. But as a reality check, at this point in 2016, Clinton was up six points, and in 2020, Biden was up eight points, and he held that lead all the way through Election Day. He lost, he won by about half of that, so obviously we would like to see this number increase dramatically. A couple of other things to consider before we get into the polls is that uh, the margin of error in a presidential poll is about four points. So anytime you look at a number, you have to think, she could be four points lower than this, or she could be four points higher. And for that reason, I really concentrate on the trajectory. We want to see her, not so much what the number is, but that the polls continue to move a little bit more in her favor. Um, next slide, please. Not going to go through all of the details here, but this just gives you an idea of the enormous accomplishment that this ticket has had in an extremely short period of time. And the Rust Belt states, um, the way this would play out is Pennsylvania, Biden won this race by 1.2 points in 2020. She started out at negative four, minus four um, in polling, and she is now leading by an average of about two and a half points. Some polls will show her much less than this. Some polls will show her more. These are just averages. But if you go through each state, you can see that despite all the inconsistencies and everything else, she has consistently moved the entire ticket between five and seven points in a month, um, which is unprecedented. It's completely extraordinary. You, she has brought in Georgia, North Carolina back into play. They had pretty much been written off, I think, by the Biden campaign. Um, she is seeing ties in Nevada um, and um, in another huge improvement in Arizona. So. The important thing to take away is the trajectory that she's on and the ability for her to close that gap so quickly. Next slide, please. The question for her is what is her ceiling? Um, is this a honeymoon period? Is this as high as she can go? Um, she's gonna need more to win. And we just don't know. We don't know we'll need to follow this through for the next few weeks and months. Um, but right now, 
you couldn't ask, I think, for a better start to the first month. Where has she drawn her support? And I think that will help us figure out where to look in the future. Um, most of her improvement have come from what the pollsters call double haters. And those were people that didn't want Biden and didn't want Trump. They were undecided as to who to vote for or whether they were going to vote at all. And if you look at the Democratic enthusiasm, and this is in the swing states, uh, it is now 85% of Democrats in all of those seven swing states are enthusiastic about voting. That is a, almost a 40-point improvement in four weeks. Um, the independent vote in swing states is at 53%. That's 20 points higher than it was two, four weeks ago, similar with the youth vote. Um, the other double hater group are Kennedy that didn't want either Biden or Trump and had decided to vote for Kennedy. He was at about 15% of the vote in those states. That is more than enough um, to have been a disaster. Um, he's polling now at about 5%. That's still enough to be a problem, but losing significant amounts of votes. His, his campaign is really flailing. They're having all kinds of legal issues. Um, you might've read that he actually reached out for sort of a pay to play um, offer to both candidates that if they promised him a big position in their administrations that he would endorse them. They both turned him down. Um, but those voters, those 10% voters that have left him are voting for Harris at a, about a two to one rate. So what does that leave? She still only has a 2% lead in the country. Where can, um, where can she pull votes from? Where are we going to see her targeting? Biden won about 65% of the Hispanics in 2020. Uh, she's at about 56%. That's 20 points higher than it was a month ago, but she still has work to do there. Fortunately, 25% of that population hasn't decided who they're going to vote for yet. So be spending a lot of time courting that vote. Um, the white working class, non-college educated um, group of people, we hear about that group a lot. That was the group that Hillary lost really in 2016. That is where Trump gets most of his support. Um, however, Biden was able to take enough of it away in 2020 to win um, and then fell off again um, during his administration. Right now, she's at about 41 percent, which is actually really good. She's picked up about 11 points, but this isn't a population that she's really going to need to work with. There are about half of the voters in the swing states would be considered white working class voters. So that's where a lot of um, her emphasis will be. Fortunately, um, the number one issue in both of these groups is the economy. But recent polling, I think to everybody's surprise, has shown when voters are asked, would you prefer Harris or Trump? Who do you trust more to handle the economy? She is rapidly rising among that group, probably why she laid out her economic plan on Friday. Um, but she's he's, she's really only within about five points of Trump, of taking over Trump as somebody that voters would rather see in charge of the economy. So we're right there on that sort of precipice of where um, she's going to end up. Um, is she at her ceiling? Is she going to be able to move into these groups um, and improve her standing even more? Next slide, please. So what are we going to look for? Um, her approval rating has also jumped almost 13 points in four weeks. That's really unusual. Um, if she hits in consistently into the low 50s, it will be very hard for her to lose this election. Um, it's uh, a, an approval rating over 50% almost always leads to a win, and she's quite close to that. Um, she needs to stay on offense. She's done a great job of that by controlling the news cycle, sort of selectively leaking out little negative things that get lost in all the noise of everything else that's happening. It's really been a masterclass in strategy, political strategy and campaigning. But she does need to move beyond those double haters. She's going to need to get into further, uh, more of the youth vote, the Hispanic vote, and that non-college educated group. All right, next slide. A little bit preview of the convention that starts tomorrow. Um, I don't know, to start off, I don't know who the musical performers are going to be. Um, that is a very hush, hush topic. Um, but supposedly there will be some. She has, however, put a little bit of a kibosh on that. She does not want to be seen as sort of Hollywood, California. So it might not be quite the Beyonce um, performance that we were hoping for, but there certainly will be some. This is the speaker um, layout. Uh, the theme of the convention is history is in your hands. 
Each day has a different theme. You can see who the speakers are going to be. The highlight um, on Monday will be President Biden uh, speaking. He'll be sort of the keynote speaker. On Tuesday, the Obamas will be there as well as Doug Ebhoff. Um, Barack will give the that keynote address late in the evening. On Wednesday, that is Vice Presidential Day, Pelosi and Bill Clinton and Pete will be speaking, um, and Governor Walsh will accept his nomination that night. Um, Thursday, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris will accept her nomination. We know that we won't have the big ceremonial votes that we normally have. She's already been voted in several weeks ago, so it will be mostly speeches um, and hopefully a few musical performances um, during the week. Next slide, please. Before I turn this over to our teams, I just want to do a little bit of covering the voter outreach landscape. Um, we've talked about the electoral landscape, but it's um, time to really concent let, concentrate on voter outreach at this point. Um, the priority is the House. We need to, regardless of um, what happens, the House is what I would consider the line in the sand. And that was a quote actually that Rudy Salas, who's one of our candidates, said and when he met with our group, um, that the House is the line in the sand. And that's because if she wins, um, we need to give her the tools to govern. If she doesn't have control of one of the houses or one of the branches and chambers, she will be a one-term president. I think we can all imagine the way the Republicans would paint her as somebody who could never get anything done as a woman and as a person of color. So we absolutely need to give her the house. When I'm making phone calls or writing postcards, I think of myself as working directly for her. Um, she can't be successful if she doesn't have the house. If we lose, the House would be the only thing that would stand between us and Project 2025 taking over um, our country. So it is critical. Um, and the, the challenge with the House is that it's difficult to get out of district volunteers, out of state volunteers to come in and work at a House race. They're local. They're not as high profile. People are very drawn naturally to the presidency and the Senate. So if you live in one of those states like we do here in California or a district, uh, you're near a district, that's a great place for you to put your energy because it's unlikely that people that live further away than you will volunteer. We're adding our work for Harris and Walsh on top of our commitment to the House. Um, and if you would like to work in the Senate, Montana is definitely the best state to work out of district or you're not, if you're not in Montana. Um, if you're in one of those other six Senate races, that's also a great place to work. But for us, for us that are working out of state for Senate races, Montana is the best choice. And then lastly, when do you want to start working? A lot of people say, I'm going to volunteer in October. The way Democrats win is by an effective get out the vote, early vote program. We are very good. We Our voters tend to want to work want to vote early and we're very good at getting them to vote early if we have enough people. The idea is to move as many Democrats as possible off of the voting list as soon and as early as possible once ballots drop. That gives us um, the ratio of volunteers to voters that still need to be contacted is much more ideal. We don't want to be spending a lot of time training people close to the election. This is the best time for you all to start with phone banking, learning how to canvas, sending texts. We want everybody, not only our volunteers, but our people that train the volunteers to be doing the direct voter outreach once ballots drop. That will happen as early as September 20th in parts of the country, but the entire country will be voting by the first week in October. So that gives us about six weeks to do this. So I'm going to turn this over to our fabulous teams, and they're going to talk about how to get started with us. I'm going to start with Jane McClure, who's one of our most senior phone bankers. In fact, she helped me learn to phone bank a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm going right. to let her take this over. <laughs> and I'll be back to talk to you guys later about um, the races if you have questions. Okay. Well, what happens is that we first, we start out each phone bank with an introduction of the campaigns that we're going to be working on. Right now we're working for Rudy Salas, who is in the Central Valley. Sometimes we have two campaigns running at the same time and people can choose. But these campaigns are strategically chosen. 
we want to be spending our time working on campaigns where we have a chance of really making a difference. So if you join our phone banks, you will know that a lot of thought has gone into choosing these campaigns. So mentors or trainers uh, provide small group training in breakout rooms. So after the campaigns are presented, um, people determine whether they are a total beginner, then there are three, whether they've had a little bit of experience and there are two, or if the ones are there, are, those are people that have called with us before, they go immediately into phoning. So they're, they're not wasting any time at all. Um, the mentors, well, uh, to begin with, I, most people feel really intimidated when they first think about doing phone banking. I know I did. I was absolutely terrified, but I had a wonderful mentor who explained to me how to do it uh, in the small group training, and then I started doing it gradually, and now it is it's really fun. And there are two things that are fun for me. One is making the calls myself, and the other one is training new people. So for example, on Saturday, I had three people who had never before done any phone banking, and, well, and all three of them were feeling a little bit intimidated. I was able to take them through the process and show them how to use their computers, answer their questions, and all three of them were able to uh, begin making phone calls by the end of the training session. Um, however, I was still available, while I was making calls myself, I was still available to answer their questions so that they felt, I think, really supported, and all three of them told me at the end that they planned to come back. You can call with a computer, a laptop, or a tablet. Uh, the dialer that we use is wonderful. It's called Scale to Win. It's the best dialer that we've ever used, and it works with most browsers. Um, you don't have to worry about your privacy because the, the phone number that the voter sees when they answer their phone is not your number. Uh, it's a, a local number. People are more likely to answer the phone if they, if they recognize the area code. And also when we introduce ourselves, we only give our first name, we don't give our last name. So you, you don't have to worry about um, somebody calling you back or not having your privacy protected. Um, one of the fun things about our phone banks is that we debrief at the end in order to share our experiences. This builds a sense of community. If people keep coming back, they recognize other people, they recognize us as the mentors. Um, and then we can share um, some tips that can be helpful to other people. Like we had several, uh, uh, tips shared this past Saturday. Uh, people were being asked some questions that they weren't sure how to respond to the voters. And another person could say, well, this is what I tried and it worked really well. So the last 15 minutes of each phone bank is a uh, debrief session. So um, as I mentioned before, right now we're calling to CA22, hoping that Rudy Salas will be elected to the House but very soon we're going to be moving to making calls for Vice President Harris. So that's, that's the deal about phone banking and I hope that many of you will decide uh, to join us. As I said, once you get comfortable with it, it's really fun. Oh, and why phone bank? Okay. Oh yeah, and this is what we fear, that, that the voters will resent the interruption of a phone call. And in, in reality, there will be some people who will say, I'm too busy now, you will have some hangups, that's just normal. But many people actually welcome the information because we're providing them with information about where to vote, how to vote, et cetera. Um, people never answer their phones. Um, the dialer only takes you to um, a real person answering the phone. So it's, you, you don't get a lot of, in fact, usually you get no situations where, where there's no answer at all. Um, MAGA voters won't be persuaded. I know a lot of people worry about that, getting into a confrontation with someone who answers the phone, but we are calling registered Democrats or independents. And so we're not in a situation um, where we have to get in arguments with people. And then some people say it's uncomfortable to talk to strangers. I really felt that way in the beginning. But let's face it, it's going to be a heck of a lot more uncomfortable if Donald Trump wins, right? 
So you get over that worry about uh, talking to strangers. It gets uh, it gets definitely easier as time goes on. Okay. Hi, I'm Joy Martin, and I'm the co-lead of the writing team with Lori Freeman. Thank you so much, Jane, for a wonderful review of the phone bank. I'll join you too. Um, we have three programs right now in our part of our postcarding program. We have an online program. We have two in-person events, and we have our packet program. The current campaigns that we're working with for the online program, where you will actually have a choice, you can choose between California 41, Will Rollins, or you can also pick John Tester for the Senate race. Those are all done online. And to do that, you need to have your own supplies. So prior to requesting them, you make sure that you've got your postcard and your stamps, and then... Lori will provide you with your list of addresses and the current script that we're working on. The programs, we have now two wonderful in-person events. Um, I am joined at those by Marianne Ross and Cindy Ostroff, who I notice are also on this call. And they're just amazing partners in helping these in-person events happen. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. We have had up to 53 people come on a Tuesday morning to Panera. Now, of course, you do have to be local for these to be an option. One is at Panera in Novato on Tuesday mornings. The other one is in San Rafael. It's in the <coughs> at a restaurant called Ounces. It's an outdoor venue. It's great for getting together, getting a glass of wine, getting a little bit of food, and writing with like-minded people. And for that, the online one, for the, I'm sorry, <coughs> excuse me, for the um, packet program, we are only doing one uh, option, and that is for uh, just for District 41. We've just finished up with David Min, and we had a wonderful turnout. We went through all of the addresses that we received. The local, the packet pickup is also for only local people. And in the, we have a bin in Greenbrae, and we have a bin in Nevada. And when you sign up, it gives you the address of where the locations of those bins. The packet program, which is the in-person they come with packets that provide you with everything. You get your addresses, you get your postcards, you get your stamps, you get stickers to decorate and make your, <coughs> excuse me, your postcards look fun. I just have an example. I'm going to just quickly hold up here for you where we kind of highlight it. We have addresses on one side and it's just fun and you're sitting in writing with like-minded people. Each packet costs $5, and that kind of helps cover some of our costs, but as stamps keep rising, it doesn't quite cover it. So anything you donate is appreciated. Um, yes, our campaigns are gonna keep changing quite quickly. So, um, and we've had just an amazing burst of energy for people coming to our postcarding events and coming to the bins. If you go to our website, you can sign up for any of these things. You can reach out to us directly. We will answer any questions that you have. Um, and thank you again very much for being here. Next slide. Uh, Susan Spitzer, texting. Hi, Joy, go rest your voice. You're, <laughs> you're always such a trooper. We're so happy you're showing up, even if you're getting over a cold. So feel better. I'm Susan Spitzer, and I am helping out with the texting program again, uh, again, this time around. Um, this time around, I think it's more fun because we've got so much more energy and people are excited when we reach out to them. So what is texting? You know, texting is you get a text on your phone, right? A lot of texting focuses on 
the, this is not what we are doing, okay? The campaigns are always asking for money and those texts are annoying. That is not what we're doing. We're not asking people for money. What we're doing is texting, to, generally speaking, people who are Democrats or we think that they're likely to be Democrats. And what we're doing is we're reminding them to vote, getting them out to the polls, making sure they're registered, looking for volunteers. So right now, a lot of what's going on in the texting world is just recruiting volunteers to help in different states. So all the swing states, we've been texting to multiple swing states where we're trying to get people to volunteer to, to come to events or to um, you know, drive people to the polls, whatever it is, where they're looking for volunteers, we can track those people down. And the, the interesting thing about texting is, again, you don't do it on your phone, just like the phone banking, you don't do it on your phone. You do need a typically some computer or tablet with a keyboard that makes it significantly easier. You don't want to do it from your phone. It doesn't come from your phone number, so your privacy is protected. There's a texting platform, and, and we can talk a little bit about that. But the, the interesting thing about texting is you can reach thousands and thousands of people with one single session of texting, just individually. I think in the 2020, I think I told Susan I texted 300,000 people, which was difficult. I, <laughs> that was a lot of text, but you can really scale with the voters that you reach and you may not always hear back from them. And typically speaking, you're, you're not gonna have all those people texting back to you, but what you're going to have is people do read those texts. You know, when you look at the research, most of those text messages are being read even if they're not being replied to. And that's super important when we get to things like, you know, make sure you're registered, make sure you signed up to vote early, make sure you've got your ballot, make sure you're still registered and turn out to vote. So there's all this opportunity to contact people and, and lots of positivity comes through it. But also, even if you don't hear back from the people, they're still getting the message and that is super valuable. Next slide. So right now, what we're working with, actually really fortunate right now to work with Gavin Newsom's team. And yes, he's a California guy. He's not, we're not trying to get votes for him, but what he's doing is his team has created this uh, basically database uh, of voters in all kinds of different states, all over the place, the swing states, you name it. We've got texting opportunities that his team has created to do things like recruiting volunteers and getting out the vote and all those things I just talked about. But he's taken on the funding for that. And so they've created this, this platform <laughs> that is quite usable. Um, it's easy to learn. You can get going immediately and we'll show you how to get to the link in a couple minutes, a couple of slides down, you'll see how to get to the link to get yourself signed up and get into the training to do it. So, you know, this is something you could really start tonight, probably if you wanted to, to put a lot of effort in and get yourself ready to go and signed up. So um, they're building out, um, you know, a, a national volunteer Sorry. base right now, working in states like Ohio, Indiana, California today. And they're messaging just progressive platform, right? It's not for a specific candidate necessarily. It's, it's for Democrats. So, you know, gun reform, reproductive rights, all that stuff. And we're calling down the list of people that are supporters so that when it gets closer and closer to the election, you know exactly who to target to say, remember, you got to get out out there today, like you got to get in line, you got to bring your ID and get out and vote. So texting is a very powerful tool. Um, you need to have a little bit of tech savvy, but not overly so. Just basic, if you're familiar with basic things on your computer, most people are able to do texting. So don't let that scare you. Um, and I think, yeah, that's that's it for texting. We'll show you how to sign up for it. And like I said, in a couple slides down. Okay. And there's more. There's more. Canvassing. Uh, canvassing is the oldest form of outreach. We think about it. That's what's been done since this nation was founded. People got together and they talked and they listened face to face. Now, modern canvassing has the advantage of targeted lists based on voter registration and past voter behavior. So when you go out to houses, you are being directed to homes where you're talking to registered Dem voters, most of whom who have not voted in recent elections. So you're going house to house to tell them that they matter. And you want to do this before October. I mean, we've been doing this since the spring. 
in the especially in the uh, in some of those very close uh, 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 congressional districts in California. Listening is mostly what you do when you're um, going door to door to encourage them to vote and to find let them know that their vote matters um, and to ask them what what matters to them because we pass that information on back to the candidate. Plus, we show them that Dems are really nice people. Um, and believe it, that's really important. Um, it's very collegial as a group. We meet as a group. When you, you text, you meet in a central headquarters. You go out in pairs. They'll pair you with an experienced texter if you've not done it before. And then we meet up afterwards, and we compare notes as a team. We share stories. And it's a great break from Zoom. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just a whole different way of interacting with voters. It has certainly made my phone banking easier since I've been texting, I mean, since I've been canvassing in some of the same areas where we've been uh, phone banking. Um, I'm going to sh just show you our canvassing webpage quickly that um, uh, provides instructions on finding canvassing op opportunities near you. This is an example of a canvas. That's me right there. We were canvassing for Adam Graves in CD13. That was of the of the two congressional districts in the Central Valley. That was the one to the farther north. It was a little closer to me in the Bay Area. Go to, and uh, sorry, I had it linked, I thought, but here we go. So a little demo of our slide, take action. We'll be seeing that earlier, Canvas voters. What I wanted to show you was that we, uh, we let you vote canvas from wherever you are and i'm aware that people are on this call from all over the country now if you're in california we do have partner with the california democratic party and the bay area coalition to canvas in ca13 and ca22 and that's this that that is adam gray and that is rudy salas they're both about two hours uh no um ca13 is about two hours four locations CD22 is about five hours, and for that, we have overnight, we have weekends, and they have um, stipends to help cover your cost of gas and overnight lodgings, although you often stay with other volunteers. Um, they uh, provide you with carpooling, uh, full support, and there's training. And right here for everybody, if you do not if that doesn't work for you in California, here's a step-by-step -step guide to find canvases near you. It's through Mobilize. It lets you know, I show you how to filter it and you can find um, canvases, hopefully in a swing district, but also canvases for some state and local races that may be very tight and they would very much welcome you um, when you sign up. So I hope you will consider canvassing and remember it comes with complete training and it comes with a lot of camaraderie. Okay, so now um, let me go back to the slides and um, here we go. All right, let me go back here. <clears throat> and we'll go to Dems Make Life Better. We've covered a lot of ground, haven't we? Here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. Hi, everyone. There you go. Um, Sorry. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so Dems Make Life Better is essentially a sister organization to Indivisible Marin. And we've talked about the traditional forms of voter outreach that have been around for quite some time, phone banking and texting and canvassing and writing. And this is a new way to do voter outreach. And it really is a great idea for people that may be strapped for time, not maybe able to sign up to Canvas or, or phone bank, or for those of you who are doing those things and want to just layer on another tactic. So essentially what this involves is wearing a Dems Make Life Better t-shirt. You can see here on the front of the t-shirt is this positive slogan about Democrats and on the back, is really shorthand for our platform that we're working for reproductive freedom and creating jobs and wages and canceling debt and all these things that make up how and why Dems are making life better. And if you wear this shirt, it will inspire 
some conversations. I don't want you to be too worried that you're going to jump into the grocery store and end up there for an hour. But, you know, you might see people, I, I've been wearing my shirt everywhere for quite a while. I get a thumbs up or a little smile, love your shirt. And then it's easy to say, great, you can get one too at dumpsmakelifebetter.org. Or depending on where you live, if you're in a more red area, you might get some uh, less um, supportive comments, just like, hey, I don't, I don't agree. I don't think Dems make life better. And we provide toolkits for how to have conversations that are constructive, that are really a lot like the conversations Betsy talked about, canvassing. It's really about listening. Oh, interesting. Tell me, tell me more about how you feel. What issues matter to you? And that personal connection, that personal conversation is, is very important. And, you know, we're not trying again to recruit Republicans, but there are a lot of disengaged Democrats, people that maybe think their vote doesn't matter. And if they see someone wearing a shirt, feel maybe a little bit of Dem pride and they might be inspired to vote, whereas maybe they weren't before. So Dems Make Life Better, you can see the URL at the bottom and really hope you go check out the site, um, buy a shirt or there's lots of other merchandise and start wearing your Dem pride and having conversations during your daily life. Okay. Um, and this is really, a lot of you have been asking in the chat, I wanna do this, how do I do it? <laughs> Which is awesome. And so we just wanted you to have a visual of our website, which is super user friendly. You don't even need to really remember the URL, just put Indivisible Marin in your search uh, bar and you'll get to our site. And the take action section is really the heart of our site. And you can see that there's a drop down for all of the different tactics. And this is where if you want a um, phone bank, just Come here, drop down to fund voters. You want to canvas, drop down there. We really make it very easy. And we'll be sending all of you a follow-up email over the next couple of days with the recording to this meeting and links um, to our website and to some of the specific links for the program. So try to make it super easy. But if you still have a question, we're very accessible info at indivisiblemarin.org. We love hearing from our volunteers. We welcome any and all questions and get back to people within a day. So um, we hope you will be motivated by the information Lori's presented. Um, things are looking a lot better than they were a month and a half ago. Can't remember exactly when it all started to change. But um, it's not in the bag by any stretch. It's going to come down to small numbers in key states, and that's for the presidential race. Um, and in the House and Senate races, you know, Kamala and Tim will only be able to be uh, transformative leaders if elected, if they have that House and Senate majority so that we can pass the legislation. So helping um, in those key House and Senate seats is really important. And this is really what we're asking you. We presented a lot of ways that you can um, take action. We try to inspire a close community where you can feel camaraderie and support. But really the, the next part of the equation is you. It's up to all of us to make that individual commitment over the next Really, it's just, you know, six weeks before early voting starting. So make that commitment. Think through how much time can I give, budget that time, and show up to make a difference. It will preserve our democracy and our freedoms. Um, so thanks for all that. We're at 4.59. Um, for those of you who need to go, we are very grateful that you came and hope that you will be inspired to take action. For those of you who would like to stick around for the Q&A, we welcome that. And um, so we'll just move on to Q&A now. Um, 
<clears throat> I somehow <laughs> I've been I've been multitasking and I I lost my document with the questions, but let me just go to the chat. I think I'll be able to remember. Um, wait a second. Let me just bear with me for a second. Okay. All right. Let's just try to find them. There was one question. I don't know. Do you did you see it, Lori? That was one kind of broad question about um, the house, good house races to work on. That was it. Um, Could you those, adjust yeah. that? Yes. Um, the best way to work in the house is to work in the closest house race that that you can. Um, and those are those 25 races. They are in California, New York. They're also Pennsylvania, Ohio, Arizona. If you have a specific area, just email us and I can hook you up with opportunities there. If you want to work here in California, then you could just work where we're working. Um, the thing about, and Joy touched on this, about working in the house is we move around quite a bit. Um, there's not as many voters to contact in a house race as there is in a Senate race. So tend to go through those lists pretty quickly, especially on the postcarding side. Um, and some phone banks also and text banks will move around daily to different races. So it kind of depends on the tactic that you want to use, but you can reach out to me directly and I can, I can help you. Right. And, you know, also keep in mind that the phone banking is done via Zoom um, almost exclusively now. So you don't need to live near one of these competitive house districts to um, make a difference. Um, that's why, you know, we are focused on two of the most competitive house races in the country that happen to be in California. But, you know, we all care about winning the house. So no matter where you live, if you support um, those two house districts by phone banging with Indy Marin, you are making a difference at the national level. And the same goes, you know, to many other um, house districts that you could call into remotely through other organizations. And as Lori said, she can steer people um, in that direction if you have a particular uh, house candidate you would like to make phone calls for. And I think that is, I think we've um, pretty much answered, uh, we answered a lot of the questions in the chat. Um, Let's see. I live in Venetia and Solano. Are there similar organizations as organized near to me? Um, I'm not familiar particularly with Venetia, but both Indivisible uh, is a national organization with chapters all over the country. Also, Swing Left is another national organization with chapters all over the country. So you could go to those websites and search by zip code to try to find a um, chapter near you. Or you could also look to find out if, you, if there's a local Dem club. Um, and again, if you get stuck, feel free to write us info at indivisiblemarin.org. We really want to do all we can to get everyone working as strategically and effectively as possible. If it's with us, great. If it's with another group, great. We're, you, we're all on the same team. And what's important is being strategic and effective. And we want to make everyone who comes to one of our meetings empowered to find the best path for them. If you look on our calendar, indivisiblemarin.org, you will see a great big fat event called Introduction to Phone Banking tomorrow at 4 p.m. Pacific. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, please use our website. There's a lot on that calendar. We've worked um, really there, hard. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, Lori, uh, Robin's asking, do you know by any chance if there's a Harris campaign in L.A.? Um. Campaign office, I should say. Campaign Sorry. office. That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure, actually. Um, My, how that, well, how I'm going to just venture it. to say that I doubt it because yeah. I imagine she's setting up campaign offices in the key battleground states for the presidential so. race. Yeah, I doubt. I doubt very much that she's got an office in California. We well, won't thank see you, the mayor's as many. 
Thank you, everyone. You know, let's, uh, what does Tim Walt say? Um, we can sleep when we're dead. I love that. That we got to be, and excuse my colorful language here, we got to be balls to the wall, right? <laughs> balls to the wall for the next, you know, and, and people are saying, oh, we have till November 5th. And we kind of do because there's certainly incremental additional votes that we'll get on the 4th and the 5th, and we'll be making those calls. But a lot of people are going to start voting in uh, September. So we're really in the sweet spot. All gas, no brakes. That's right, Joy. <laughs> well, and I, I love the the DNC uh, history is in our hands. I think that it's everybody's hands, not just the people that are going to the convention, but all of us out in the country. It's It's up to us. And that's one thing that's so inspiring about the Harris Waltz campaign is they are making it about us, right? They are saying it will, it takes all of us and this is a citizen led campaign and they're right. And it's very inspiring to be, um, to hear those words from our national leaders. Okay, everyone, thank you for your time. We will send thank a recording you for being of here. the meeting, the links and all that and stay in touch.